Maine is the easternmost and northernmost state in the contiguous United States, and it's known for its expansive forests, breathtaking coastlines, and its unique New England culture. So much of its territory is covered by trees that it's nicknamed the Pine Tree State. If you enjoy hiking or just taking a stroll in the woods, you're in for a treat. 90% of Maine's territory is covered in trees. Acadia National Park, which is hugged by the Atlantic Ocean, is stunning with scenic landscapes and wildlife, such as bears, moose, and whales. Acadia and Maine in general boast a multitude of hiking trails. On them, you might find blueberries. Maine is the largest producer of blueberries in the United States. As a visitor in Maine, a typical day might include visiting the rocky coastline and its iconic lighthouses. Many small, picture-worthy fishing villages are also waiting for you. For example, Winter Harbor, Lubeck, or Stonington, which looks like a painting in reality. The state's economy is driven by forestry, fishing, and tourism. As a tourist in Maine, you should know that Augusta is the capital and Portland is the most populous city. Portland is known for its rich arts scene and it was rated the number one food city in the US by Bon Appetit. If you go, be sure to order up some local delicacies like a lobster roll and a warm slice of blueberry pie for dessert. When in doubt, always talk to locals. In fact, today we'll be talking to one. Brent, who is a middle school English teacher in Maine, will share some very interesting stuff about his state, its culture, and of course, about his life. You might know Brent already. He's all over the internet. You'll find him on YouTube, on Instagram. He's Speak English with this guy. Hi, everybody. My name is Shauna, and this is the American English Podcast. My goal here is to teach you the English spoken in the United States. Through common expressions, pronunciation tips, and interesting cultural snippets or stories, I hope to keep this fun, useful, and interesting. Let's do it. Hi, everybody. Welcome back to a new Discover a New State episode. Today, I am here with Brent, speak English with this guy, who is originally from Maine, I believe, but we're going to find out a lot more about the state of Maine in this episode. So my goal here is to tap into his life experience, get to know him, so that you guys also get to know a local. That's what I want. And I hope you guys walk away from this thinking, hey, I know a little bit more about the state and I know someone from there. So let's welcome Brent. Hi, Brent. Hey, Shauna, how are you? I'm doing really well. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. Yeah, we just had daylight savings time, so it stays uh, light a little bit later in the day. So I feel like I have a little bit more energy. That's good. Okay, so you're in Maine right now. Does that mean it's it's three hours later than in California? What time is it right now? We are recording this at about 6.18 p.m., which is just mm -hmm. about two hours before my bedtime because I'm an <laughs> old man and I get up really early. Okay, so what time does it get dark in Maine around this time of year? If we were recording this in December, mm -hmm. the sun would start going down at about 3.30 p.m. And by the summer, when we get to June, the sun will be up until almost 9 p.m. Ooh, for me, that sounds perfect because I, I love daylight hours when I can go out and explore and do things. Is that your favorite time of year in the state? No, absolutely. I love summer. In fact, I did an English lesson teaching the word loathe, and mm -hmm. I used loathe to describe how I felt about winter. So I love summer. I don't really like winter. So a long time ago, I lived in New York, and I took a trip uh, with Amtrak, which is great for anyone listening. You can get great Amtrak deals. 
in the Northeast. It goes everywhere. And I took a trip up to Montreal and it was mid-April. And in my head, in my California head, I was thinking, ooh, we're going to have so much fun outdoors and it's spring already. And it was still cold. There was still ice on things. What's the weather like in April, May? Is it still snowy outside? Well, right now we do have snow on the ground still. Okay. Today, it reached about 50 degrees Fahrenheit. So for me living in Maine, that was balmy. That was nice. I enjoyed it. <laughs> Maybe for you living in Southern California, Chilly. you would be freezing. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I really liked it. But there have been some years in Maine where we have gotten a foot of snow on April 1st and as late as April 15th. Wow. So I want to ask you why you live there if you loathe it so much. But first, I want to get to know you a little bit more. So you mentioned you are an English teacher. Can you tell me a little bit about who you are, what you do? Yeah, sure. So I've been an English teacher in the United States for 20 years. This is my 20th year. And all of my students are native English speakers, and they are between the ages of 13 and 14. Some days are pretty tiring. They have a lot of energy, and there yeah. are a lot of them. I have about 80 students and only one of me. So, but and it's have, fun. It, it's a lot of fun. Yeah, I really like that age because if you remember yourself at 13 and 14, you're like unsure of yourself. And a lot of times you just need someone to understand. So for me, yes, the learning is important, but developing relationships with my students to just get them through probably one of the most difficult times in their life. So th that I find that rewarding. So you're sort of an English teacher and at the same time a therapist. At, yeah. at certain times, absolutely. What are middle schoolers in Maine learning in an English class? What sorts of literature do you guys read? I don't know how much you want to go into this because it's kind of a dark subject, but um, we have something in English called humanities. So that is when an English teacher will, yes, teach English, but they'll also bring in some social studies with that. So maybe some geography, maybe some history. So right now we are studying genocides. So, oh, okay. Yeah. Not a fun topic. <laughs> no, no, not exactly. But a fascinating topic. And I yes. love, we don't get too, you know, grisly with that. I don't think there's a need for mm -hmm. 13 and 14 year olds to see that kind of stuff, but just to understand a little bit of human psychology, like what has to happen for that to take place? We've also studied Harriet Tubman. In mm -hmm. the railroad. Yes, very important. Mm -hmm. We don't study as much literature mm -hmm. as they might in high school. So okay. no Shakespeare, no The Scarlet Letter, things like we probably had to read in high school. Yeah. So more contemporary things. Okay. You mentioned right before this call that Stephen King is from Maine. Do you guys read Stephen King at school to get in touch with your home state. <laughs> Stephen King is my favorite author by far. And when students are like really good readers, I will suggest Stephen King to them. And depending on the year, a couple years ago, the movie It came out. So mm -hmm. all of my students were really into Stephen King. So I was able to get a lot of his books into my students' hands. This year, not so much for some reason. Yeah. That's cool, though, to be able to, you know, read those and know that his house is not too far away, where he wrote these incredible storylines. I feel closer to someone when they're somewhat in proximity to where I am. I don't know if you feel that way, too, but yeah. yeah absolutely. Because yeah. a lot of the things that he writes about mm -hmm. are places that I've been. And he even my high school growing up, he mentions the locker rooms in his book, Carrie. So actually one of my friends in high school appeared in one of his books. So it's Whoa. Yeah, it, the proximity is a thing. Yeah. That is very cool. Was Carrie filmed there by any chance? Do you know? Jeez, I don't know. I don't think so. Okay. We don't have a lot of 
movies filmed in Maine because it's mm. so so hard to get the equipment here and I think Atlanta maybe and also where you live but not very many here in Maine. Got you. All right, so Maine as a state. You guys are pretty big, right? You're not as big as like New York or Pennsylvania. How are you in terms of size? That's a good question. I know for New England, right? Mm-hmm. That's a, it's a bunch of small states. I don't know if you've ever thought of this, but our country started on the East Coast and those East Coast states are smaller. And by the time they got out West, I think they just said, whatever, we'll put a state here. <laughs> There's just giant states out West. So compared to other states where I live, we're very big. We're as big as the other five New England states put together. Oh, wow. It's, I don't know if that's saying, because Rhode Island is one of them and it's really small, mm-hmm. but, and our roads are not great. So to okay. go from the Southern part of my state all the way to the Northern part would take you seven hours. Oh, Wow. Wow. And are there a lot of people living in that m- Northern part of Maine or Where's the population located? So our biggest city is Portland. Okay. And I think there are about 90,000 people who live in Portland. Okay. And there are only 1.3 million people that live in Maine. So wow. yeah, we're pretty sparsely populated. I like to create these images of how a place is. And I'm imagining very cute towns, very outdoorsy people. And- a lot of beards. Lots of beers <laughs> and a lot of arts and crafts. I don't know why I get this image of people being very DIY, like working with their hands in woodwork, steelwork. I don't know where this comes from, but is that true? Is that stereotype true? <laughs> I do. I believe it is true. It's not right. true for me because mm-hmm. I, I can't fix anything. Luckily, my <laughs> brother kind of fits that stereotype, but I think man, maybe self-reliant, right? Mm -hmm. If if that term, if your listeners know that term, like you have to rely on yourself. You have to do things for yourself. You have to be able to fix things because there just aren't a lot of people around. So if you don't do it, nobody will. I never thought about the correlation between those two things, small towns and people with the ability to fix things. How interesting. Yeah. Cool. So in your state then, so you've got, you said 90,000 in Portland and the rest of the state, you got all these towns spotted all over the place. Now, what else is there? I have Arcadia National Park, Acadia National Park, excuse me. What is Acadia National Park? So Acadia National Park might be the most beautiful place on earth. Okay. You have some small mountains One of the most famous mountains there is called Mount Cadillac. And people say that if you are on Mount Cadillac at sunrise, you will be the first person in the United States to see the sun. I don't know if that's true. Well, it kind of makes sense because I think you're the easternmost, northernmost and easternmost state, right? I think so. It definitely makes sense. I think I'm probably the farthest one of the farthest people away from you in the entire United States being in LA. (laughs) I was thinking that before we recorded, we kind of have the opposite corners covered. Is San Diego a little further south than you? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you can go a little bit further south. You can go maybe two hours north from me and you will hit Canada. Mm -hmm. We're pretty close to opposite ends of the country. Very far away. So Mount Cadillac is where you would go then to watch the sun, sunrise and sunset. I think it would be beautiful. Yeah. I think when you think of Maine, you think of these little towns near the coast Well, there's a town called Bar Harbor there and it's quaint. That's the adjective I would use to describe Bar Harbor quaint. Okay. And what comes to mind when you think of the word quaint? Because for me, it gives some images. What, What do you think of? I think of wooden buildings not a whole lot of metal. I think of um, a rocky coast. I think of lobster traps. I think of buoys in the ocean. I think of lobster boats, maybe an accent. We, We have a little bit of an accent here in Maine. 
Okay. I d- didn't catch on to that yet. I, you sound sort of like me. The listeners will be a better judge of this for sure. I've tried to get rid of my accent, but a lot of times people won't pronounce their R's here. Huh. And there's kind of a joke. Well, we have the Boston accent and our main, it's called down East, which is mm-hmm. like on the coast. So they also have an accent. I will do my best impression of a main accent. Okay. Okay. Ready. So to say yes, you might hear I ah, I ah. <laughs> Have you ever have I like you ever heard that? that? <laughs> I like that. No, I have not heard of that. That's new for me. Okay. So without the R's, you might hear something. I need to pack the car. <gasps> it's a little like Boston. I like that. Okay. So you said lobster traps, right? So then would it be a lobster tap? <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Really? Gotta go get the lobster Ooh. trap. Lobster. Lobster. So you eat your lobster. So this is great because lobster is not something that I have off the coast of California from my awareness. But Maine is one of the main producers of lobster, or not producers, but I guess you would say catchers of yeah, lobster. Yeah. Harvesters or, or, yeah, what do you do? You <laughs> don't fish lobster. You trap, yeah, you trap, trap it. You trap, you trap <laughs> lobster. Yes. Okay. Main, tr- one of the um, biggest lobster trappers in the United States, if not in the world, I don't know statistically, but what can you tell me about? Lobsters in Maine. Lobsters in Maine is something that I don't really like to eat, but which is a good thing because I think they're expensive. And one of the things that I've heard that make Maine lobsters so great is that our water is just the perfect temperature, like Goldilocks in, in the bed. It's not too hard. It's not <laughs> too soft. Our water isn't too cold and it's not too hot. So for whatever reason, our waters are really good at producing good lobster. That's crazy. I recently watched an episode of Feed Phil. Have you heard of that show? No. Is it Phil as in a person? You have to feed this person? (laughs) Yes, Phil, P-H-I-L. And he has a show on Netflix. The guy's really goofy, really funny. I I really like him. But he, he went to Maine and he was out on the boat with a fisherman on this boat called the Lucky Catch. And they went out to get the lobster from the traps. So they don't know what they're going to get when they're actually picking up the trap. Are we going to have lobster in there or not? If there's a female on the boat and if they see eggs on the bottom of its body, they'll just throw it back out there because they know that is a breeder and that's going to bring in a lot more money. (laughs) And I thought that was so interesting. Like I didn't know anything about lobster trapping and... Yeah, it's so popular there. Yeah, there are a lot of rules that lobstermen have to follow. And that is one of them. You cannot take a female with eggs. If it is too small, you can't take it either. There might be something about the shell. I'm not Hmm. sure. There's soft shell lobster and hard shell lobster. People who eat lobster, it might taste different. (laughs) I was going to say, we actually have lobster ice cream here in Maine. (gasps) Oh my goodness. Have you tried it? I can't promise I have tried it. It doesn't help that I don't like lobster, but I really like ice cream. So I thought it would be kind of good. And to me, it was terrible. So I can't even promise if you like Mm. lobster and you like ice cream that you will like lobster ice cream, but it's a thing here. Maybe you needed some butter on the top, like a lobster roll. I don't eat a lot of lobster, but Mm -hmm. butter... Butter makes it all better. Mm-hmm. Melted butter in a cup. Yeah. And do they actually have little kettles of butter to pour on top of the lobster rolls? Is that a thing? Oh, yes, absolutely. But people who eat just lobster without the roll, they will dunk. They will dunk their lobster mm-hmm. in in like a butter bowl, you know, like a cereal yeah. bowl just filled with <laughs> melted butter. You're a Mainer, right? Are you a Mainer? I think so. Some people call us maniacs, though. Maniacs? Yeah. So I'm not sure Mainer, (laughs) maniacs. I think both work. Maybe being from California, I probably shouldn't call you a maniac. Maybe that's like an in-state thing to call each other. (laughs) 
It's fine. I won't be okay. offended. Is there something that Mainers, that they eat that you do like, that is either native to Maine or, you know, that you think of and you go, oh, that's something that you have to try if you come here? Okay, let's see. How about something called a whoopie pie? That might be just like a main thing. Have you ever heard of a whoopie pie? I have. They're not very popular here. I think my parents told me about them and they lived in different states. What is a whoopie pie? Basically, a whoopie pie is like a big, soft cookie that's almost Mm -hmm. like a cake. So it's definitely like a sandwich with lots of sugary cream in the middle. Mm -hmm. And it can sometimes have a thousand calories in it. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, I have a friend that this restaurant sells a whoopie pie. And maybe you should split it with somebody. But Mm -hmm. he now lives in Connecticut. Every time he comes up. He has a whoopie pie, a thousand calories and one dessert. That's pretty intense. I think it's probably very delicious if someone's willing to have that many calories at once. (laughs) Yeah, I can't imagine. He must have a horrible headache after with all that sugar, I would think. Like what what would satisfy your palate? Like a moxie? You mentioned moxie before? No, that's another. Maybe I'm living in the wrong state, but (laughs) moxie is something else that we have in Maine that I don't like. But if you ever travel to Maine, there's a good chance that a native Mainer will Mm -hmm. want you to try this. And I do. I have an uncle who loves Moxie, but not many people do. And if I had to describe how Moxie tastes, think of Coke and then drop some aspirin in a Coke. And I think that's what Moxie tastes like to me. <laughs> so maybe an, an acquired a, taste? I was exactly going to say that. Yes, okay. an acquired taste. The first time you have it, you might not like it, but maybe the second, third, fourth time, you eventually like it. But Okay. All right. So people have to try a moxie with the lobster roll on the side and then for dessert, a whoopie pie. That would be like a very well-rounded main meal. I think so. Yeah. Okay. We also have um, something else called red hot dogs. So they're actually red. And I I can't imagine the food dye is very good for you, but they are also called red snappers. So think of a hot Hmm. dog with a pretty thick casing on the outside. And so when you bite into it, it literally snaps. Oh, wow. In high school, I worked at a deli and we had two women who would drive up from Connecticut about four or five hours just to get our red hot dogs. Are they different from regular hot dogs in any way other than the red, the red color? Do they have a different flavor or are the toppings different? I don't think so. They're a little bit slippery when you put the (laughs) toppings on. So I don't know. I... I will have hot dogs sometimes, but some people really love their red snappers. And I think they're only native to Maine. Okay. Yeah, I definitely haven't hadn't heard of that. And what about um, blueberries? I've heard blueberries are also very big. I'm glad you mentioned the blueberries because we've just been talking about super unhealthy foods. So yes, mm-hmm. this will be good. I've heard that we do have some great blueberries here in Maine, wild blueberries. So they might be a little bit smaller than you might buy in a store. And in the fall, their leaves turn really red. So they're beautiful to look at and delicious to eat. When you want to get outside of your house and you want to connect with nature, what are the things you would go and do? Because I'm imagining you have this beautiful Acadia forest with all these hiking trails, maybe even covered in blueberries, possibly? Yes. If there are blueberries and you're in northern Maine Mm -hmm. or any berries of any kind, you you do have to watch out for bears a little bit. We do have black bears here in Maine. In fact, our college, the University of Maine, is called the Black Bears. Oh, okay. So, and do they approach No, luckily our black bears, they're, they're smaller. They're not like the grizzly bears or the polar bears. Mm -hmm. So usually they're more scared of you. And in fact, I have never seen one in the wild, but 
we have quite a few black bears here. Yeah. We actually do in California too at like the big parks in Yosemite and, and Kings Canyon and stuff. But yeah, it's the same thing. They're kind of minding their own business. But if you have people food, they love, they'll eat all of your red snapper hot dogs. They'll grab your whoopie pies. They'll just eat anything. Absolutely. Yeah. You also have moose, don't you? We do. We do have moose. And I have seen them in the wild. In fact, I live in southern central Maine. Mm-hmm. So we don't have a lot of moose here, but one day when I was in elementary school, I was sick that day. I wasn't at school, but a moose walked through our playground. No. And I had to hear about it the next day. And I was so sad that I missed that day, but we actually had a moose no. go across our playground. And they're ginormous. Yeah. I, and I'm going to stop for a second really quick because I think the listeners are hearing moose, moose, and we're not saying mooses. This is one of those irregular plurals where you don't you don't say meese. It's not like a goose that turns to geese. It's not meese. And we don't add an S. So it's not mooses. It's moose, which is one of those weird ones. But yeah. Yeah. I just was wondering, you know, are they friendly? Are they going to come and attack you? Or do they just, you know, mind their own business? So I think the most dangerous thing when you encounter a moose would be on the road. Okay. Because a lot of times they will wander onto the road and they're so dark, you can't see them. Would you like to hear a story about me finding a moose or many moose on a road? Yes. <laughs> okay. Please. <laughs> so I have two children and one is a hockey player and one is a singer. And one of my children, my daughter, had a concert and it got over really late at night. But my son had a hockey game the next morning in Montreal, which is about five hours away from where I live. So I knew I had to be traveling in Northern Maine after dark in the spring, which is not good. So the road had a 45 mile an hour speed limit, but I really couldn't go more than 20 or 25 because I kept running into moose. Luckily, I was able to slow down, but they're so big and so dark. I didn't really see them until I was only a few feet away. And that night we saw eight moose on the road. No, that's nuts. Did you get any pictures? No, I think it was too dark. I didn't want to stop and bother them too much. They are pretty docile. They're pretty chill. They, they're not aggressive, but if you do hit them, they do weigh a lot. And they usually come right through the windshield if you do. So oh, I just tried to make my way around them and leave them be. Wild. Yeah. The moose populations. I mean, there must just be a lot up there because I've heard, you know, Canada around, I think, Quebec, like that area just has mm-hmm. a good amount. <laughs> good I amount. think they do. Yeah. Eight, eight in a, in a, like a two hour That's a trip. lot. That is <laughs> a lot. But wow, what a cool experience. And I mean, to be able to tell that story, it's not something that you hear every day. That's for no. sure. <laughs> that was the only fun thing about it is I get to tell the story after. But I was very <laughs> scared that night. Yeah, no, no kidding. But you don't eat moose, do you? I have never eaten moose. And mm-hmm. I know that there are quite a few moose, like we said, mm-hmm. but for hunters, they have to apply for a lottery. So every year I might have a student or two that will miss a week of school to go moose hunting because they won this lottery. Oh, wow. They they do. I have students who eat moose, but I I never have. Wow. That's really interesting. Is hunting a common activity, a hobby there? Yeah, I think it is quite common. I have a lot of students every year that that love to hunt and they do it the right way. Uh, They eat the meat. They don't waste it. I've talked to them about taking the right shot so that the animal doesn't have to suffer. So I I respect the people that hunt the right way. I just don't do it, but it is popular where I live. Yeah, that's interesting. My brother is a hunter and he he gets the weirdest stuff and he wants to eat it, which is great. I'm, I'm so happy. If, you know, if you're going to kill something, please, by all means, eat the thing. But there's a lot of turkeys where I live in Northern California. And he'd be like, OK, here's the turkey. And he'd bring it home. And the, the wild ones are massive. They're much bigger than a turkey you'd see at Thanksgiving. And it's wild. So it's just gamey. And gamey is a 
funny adjective. How would you describe gamey? <laughs> that is a good question because I try not to eat anything gamey, but I know exactly what you're talking about. It's Probably like, tastes like real meat. Real meat, funky and wild. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So that was not not enjoyable to eat what my brother got. You've eaten wild turkey? Yes. And it tastes a lot different from store-bought turkey? Yes. Yes. <laughs> a million times. It's not good. But then again, he didn't have a nice display of it either. He would bring bags, Ziploc bags, filled with meat. And I'm like, you're not just going to present it to me in a Ziploc bag. <laughs> you know what I mean? Was it, was it refrigerated? Did he put it in a cooler, maybe? Uh, I don't know. I honestly don't know. <laughs> but um, anyway, moving on from the hunting. Yeah, we have a few interesting things that I'd like to talk about. Portland Head Light. Does that ring a bell? It does. <laughs> I've heard that it's the most photographed lighthouse in the world. Okay. And if you ever do come to Portland, this is in Cape Elizabeth, which is mm -hmm. the next town over from Portland. It's maybe a 20-minute drive. And I think if you think of a lighthouse, you probably are thinking of Portland Headlight. It's just, it's iconic. I had a friend from Italy come and visit um, last summer. And the first thing we went to see was Portland Headlight, just because it, it just screams Maine. Can you actually go up inside of it? You or... cannot, cannot. But it kind of goes out a little bit on the rocks. So mm -hmm. you can tour the area but you can't go inside. There is a museum at mm -hmm. the bottom, which you can go into. You just can't go to the top, unfortunately. Got you. You know, even there, I'm sure the beach is also pretty, right? Rocky coasts, you were saying? We have some sandy beaches, but we also have some rocky coasts. Mm -hmm. In fact, we have a, a beach called Old Orchard Beach, mm -hmm. which is very famous. You mentioned Quebec earlier. Mm -hmm. And I'm only about two hours from Quebec. Wow. So a lot of times when people from Quebec want to see the ocean, they will come to Old Orchard Beach. So there's a lot of French spoken in Old Orchard Beach in the summer. Oh, wow. Okay. And is that also, sorry to speak about French now, but is that also a second, common second language there just being so close in proximity to French speaking Canada? Okay. So where I grew up, there were a lot of mills. There were a lot of textile mills that made like shoes and pillows and bed sheets. So at one time, a lot of people came down from Quebec and settled into my town. So a lot of people who are my parents' age grew up speaking French. Like no that way. might have been their first language. No. Way. And unfortunately, you know, that generation is is getting older and dying off. But now the second most spoken language in my town is Somali. So there's been a huge change in just about a hundred years going from a major second language of French to a pretty major second language of Somali. Oh, wow. And I'm guessing there's a lot of immigrants coming from Somalia. Absolutely. Right okay. yep. And do you speak another foreign language? Do you speak French a little bit? No, Somali? I mean, a little bit. Um, okay. <laughs> I've been uh, studying Italian for four years. And why Italian? Is that just destination, dreaming of pasta? Well, that doesn't hurt. But <laughs> as so many Americans learn Spanish and French. I thought, let me be a little different. I'll learn Italian. Clearly, you like it if you've stuck with it for four years. It's been off and on. That's why mm -hmm. my my Italian isn't great, but I spend a couple couple hours a week on it. I've just been busy, you know, doing other things. Mm -hmm. But at one time I was studying a lot. Yeah. I, I do. I love foreign language. Do you speak any foreign languages? Yeah, we, we speak Portuguese at home. Um, my husband's Brazilian. And then my major in college was German and did a bit of time in um, France. And then in Spain, I lived for a year. So I, I like dabbling my parents think if you lived in a place, you speak the language. So they go around telling people, oh, my daughter does this and this. And it's like, no, you guys, <laughs> I, I feel confident in German and Portuguese, but not in Spanish, French or any of the other places I've lived, which is, yeah. yeah. Well, that's amazing. Yeah. I have a few other questions for you. 
I want to get more into your personal life. You are married. You have two kids. Your wife, yes. you mentioned, is from Alabama originally. She How? Was from Alabama. She was on the Gulf, right? Warm weather and, right. you know, catching some crawfish and not lobster. It's possible. <laughs> yep. And then she decides to move up up there, which I mean, I personally think it sounds great. I just want to know how that happened. Oh, geez. Okay. So <laughs> back in 1996, you know, uh, what is that? Almost 30 years ago. I like how you say 1996. It makes it sound so much longer ago instead of 1996. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. I have a friend who's a comedian and he got me saying that and back in 1900. Yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah. So back in 1996, as most Americans would say back in 1996, I was going to college at the University of Maryland. She was at the University of Alabama. She was taking a computer class because back then computers were a new thing and people didn't know how to use them. And I was at Maryland and trying to get away from my roommate as much as I could. So I went mm -hmm. to the computer lab and we met online. So I'd like to think that we are one of the oldest couples who are still together 27 years ago. First internet couple out there. <laughs> Right? Can 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 that be our claim to fame? Yeah. Well, how did you meet online? How, how So we happen? were in this thing called Globe Chat and okay. it was just it was a chat room. And I think it was mostly college students in there because mm -hmm. not a lot of people had computers at their home back then. Yeah. Her name is Jamie and mm -hmm. I was just chatting. Jamie from Alabama. I thought she was a guy for a little while, so we were talking football. You know, we just kept meeting and we were we were the only two people in that chat who used our real names or uh -huh. anything that resembled a human name. So we kind of gravitated towards each other and would chat and just talk about life. And I guess within a couple of weeks, it was like, oh, wow, you're, you're dateable. You're somebody that I might like. Yeah. And so we snail mailed pictures of each other oh my gosh! because I don't think you could send a photo. I don't know. That's so funny. I love that. I love snail mail too. That term is great because that's just referring to regular post, right? You go to the USPS, United States Postal Service, and you put a stamp on the letter, you write your return address, and then you mail it off to, and you don't know if it's going to arrive, at least nowadays, I feel <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> yeah. right. But that's crazy. So that's snail mail. You sent snail mail back and forth and uh, you waited like yeah, five days. Six... days. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. And I thought, you know, she was pretty good looking and maybe she thought the same about me, but whatever. And a couple months later, she had spring break. So she said, hey, I'll come see you. And then a couple months later, I went down to see her. And so after a year, I transferred down to Alabama and graduated there. I taught a year. She's also a teacher. Okay. So we were both teaching in Alabama and we thought we might want to have children one day. So she was like, let's go back up to Maine. And I said, it's really cold up there. And she said, I don't care. And then we moved back. And then she found out it was cold up here. And yeah. now we might want to move away from Maine when our kids get a little bit older because it Got is so you. cold. But it's beautiful in the summer. Now that you just mentioned your wife and your story is beautiful. Jamie, right? Jamie? Yes, okay. Jamie. Is there something that you two have done together in the state that you were like, this is just memorable? So we have this ritual because, you know, when you have kids, mm -hmm. you become mom and you become dad, but you forget to be a husband and a wife. Mm -hmm. So even when the kids were small, my kids are teenagers now, but even when they were small, we would just go away to one of the best cities in the world. And that is Portland, Maine. And it's only about 45 minutes from where I live, but it does have some of the best food in the world. And so we would just take a night, forget about everything, have some really good food. It was a nice way to get away a couple times a year. What's so special about Portland, Maine? So I was in New York City a couple of weeks ago. Mm -hmm. New York City is great, but it's it's huge. It takes a long time to get anywhere, it seems like, in New York mm -hmm. City. Boston's a little smaller. It might not have as much to offer, but I will put Portland, Maine's food. And if you like beer, 
we have a lot of breweries. So I will put our breweries and our restaurants up against those two other Northeast cities any day. I know people are going to listen to this and go, oh, Maine is now on the list of places I have to go to. Do you have a brewery recommendation or a restaurant recommendation that you can remember? Yeah. I think probably my favorite place to get food, and if you like alcohol, there's this place called Liquid Riot. Okay. And they serve some really great food, but they also make their own spirits there. So they distill vodka and whiskey. They brew beer there. So that's a great place. If you're looking for some really good lobster, you can go to a place called High Roller. High Roller Lobster, I think it's called. High Roller, I know for sure. And you can get a really good lobster roll there. And you can also get something called, what is it? A lobster lollipop? Correct me if I'm wrong, but I think you can get a lobster tail on a stick. I think I remember having that. Now, I don't like lobster a lot, but I like their lobster. And I think you said earlier, Shauna, you love lobster rolls. I do. Yes. Yeah. I think you would love this place. Lovely. So Liquid Riot and High Roller. They also have Buffalo Lobster, which is lobster with like hot sauce. Buffalo sauce. Mm, I don't know about that. Like having something so delicate and such a subtle flavor. And then that would kind of ruin it for me, I feel. I don't like lobster. So maybe that's why I kind of like it. Okay. <laughs> well, the, the the show I just was mentioning previously, Feed Phil, he actually preferred the curry lobster roll over all of them. And so I don't know, to each his own. <laughs> they do yeah. have a good curry ketchup at High Roller. Oh, curry I like ketchup. ketchup. So good. Good. Okay. So we've got your two recommendations. Is there anything else you would like to share about Portland, about your state, about yourself? How about this, about my state, which makes it unique? Two things. Mm -hmm. Maine is the only state that has one syllable. Maine. I like that. Maine. The Maine state. <laughs> That's it, right? Because mm -hmm. a lot of people like they say like, oh, they're from the great state of Maine. It's almost like you have to put something else with the name because it's just yeah. it's Maine. So short. Yep. <laughs> and the other thing is that Maine is the only state that borders just one state. That's a there are fact. some states that border zero states like Alaska and Hawaii, but Maine's the only state that borders one state. We border New Hampshire. New Hampshire. Right. So you also got the beautiful fall foliage, I'm guessing. Absolutely. Yeah. I actually went on the main website before this, and I noticed it's very specific at when people should visit Maine. And because the state is a little bit bigger, it's divided into the northern region when it would be best to see the reds, oranges, and yellow leaves on the trees there versus the south in the central area because it happens like a weak difference between the It <laughs> between does, the yeah. It's crazy. We call it um, peak season. Peak, yeah. yeah. We also have uh, leaf peepers. Those are the people that come from out of state to look at the leaves. Leaf peepers. Oh, that will be me someday. <laughs> I hope so. Brent, it was so wonderful talking to you. You have so much good insight into your state and just... Yeah, your stories are great. I'm, I'm imagining my next trip up there. I'm going to come across some moose, maybe eight of them. Maybe I'll beat you. I'll get nine. <laughs> I'll have some lobster and I'm going to, yeah, just enjoy all the delicacies you mentioned, the blueberries, red snapper hot dogs and the whoopie pies and the, I feel like we talked about food a lot, but Acadia National Park, get out in nature, go over to the quaint villages you mentioned, Cape Elizabeth, you said. Portland Headlight, absolutely. Lighthouse. I mean, yeah, nature and food. What more can you ask for? I don't think you can ask for anything more. Well, thank you so, so much for coming on the show. Once again, can you share with everybody how they can access you and your content? Yeah, sure. I think if you just look for like speak English with this guy, maybe on YouTube and Instagram, Facebook, I think you'll find me somehow that way. Yes. Well, thank you and have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you. You too. <laughs> Bye. Thank you for listening to this episode of the American English Podcast. 
Remember, it's my goal here to not only help you improve your listening comprehension, but to show you how to speak like someone from the States. If you want to receive the full transcript for this episode, or you just want to support this podcast, make sure to sign up to premium content on AmericanEnglishPodcast.com. Thanks and hope to see you soon.